Welcome to What She Said. I'm your host, Lucy Lucraft, a freelance journalist and blogger from London. Each week, I chat to awesome humans about their journey to where they are today, and we share lots of blogging tips and tricks too. You can hear the entire back catalogue, as well as new episodes wherever you listen to podcasts by searching for my name or searching what she said, or you can go to my website, wanderloose.com. And if you want to come say hi online, I'm at Lucy Lucraft on Instagram or Twitter, or over at my blog, wanderloose.com. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of What She Said. This one is a little bit different (laughs) as my wonderful guest, Sass Petherick, inadvertently gives me an hour of therapy. (laughs) If you don't know Sass, she's one of the most awesome humans around. I discovered her through Sarah Tasker's podcast, Hashtag Authentic, and quickly became enamoured with her dulcet Kiwi tones and awesome podcast, Courage and Spice. She's a self-doubt expert, coach and mentor for women who want to transcend their self-doubt and cultivate self-belief instead. I can't emphasise enough how incredibly empowering Sass is and I want to tell you gently that you need her in your life. I went on one of Sass's retreats, Write Yourself Home, um, back in February and it was a real turning point for me in my self-doubt journey. So, In this episode, we discuss something that I'm more than a little bit preoccupied with, feedback. Good, bad, we're all bombarded with it, and especially so when we've chosen a life and a career online. If you need to hear an episode that will make you feel everything's okay, this one's for you. In fact, whoever you are and whatever you need, this episode is for you. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Sass. How are you? I'm so good. It's International Women's Day. (laughs) And I happen to be one. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) So yeah, it's cool. It's a good day. Sun's out in Bristol. I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day for women everywhere. Well done, weather. You've come out in force for International Women's Day. Yeah. Yeah. To all of our sisters and and sisters with a C. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> so for anybody that doesn't know who you are, would you be able to tell us a little bit about your journey to where you are today, please? Sure, sure. So I, um, as you pro- can probably guess, I'm from New Zealand. And I used to be a management consultant in, in both New Zealand and then in the UK. And I worked in a really fancy corporate job uh, and I wore lots of suits. I was annoyingly ambitious and I drank my feelings. And um, eventually I just burnt out and took six months off, really, and questioned all of my life choices to date. And I realized that uh, self-doubt had been the thing that I had been battling with my whole life, really, not just in my work but also in my personal life and I saw a therapist for quite a long time and as I kind of put myself back together I realized that I wanted a different kind of life and so I retrained I went and did some coach training and then I eventually completed a master's degree at Oxford uh, in coaching and mentoring and my dissertation was about our experience of self-doubt which was a kind of punt. I didn't really know that that was the thing that I wanted to do, but it was the only thing that held my attention. And that was about four years ago now, and it has continued to hold my attention. And so my work now is about helping other people to transcend self-doubt, to understand where it comes from, how normal and human of an experience it is. And so I do things like one-to-one coaching and workshops and group programs and in-person retreats uh, and just a hundred different ways really to try and look at this really fascinating phenomenon of of self-doubt, how it works, uh, why it's there. It has a really important purpose and, um, and helping people to make sense of it. And that's really partly because my bigger mission is to, you know, help do my part to create a world I want to live in, which is where we have uh, healed and healthy and whole people running things. Because we've seen what happens when the alternative is true. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at now. And I'm I'm actually starting to I've just started this year to write a book about self doubt and. Oh, wow. 
and that's kind of based on my research and, and some of the podcast interviews I've been doing for my podcast as well. So, yeah, I'm kind of excited. I've, I've sort of landed in this world and it is – it's quite thrilling and exciting and endlessly interesting to me. So I could talk about this stuff all day. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm hoping that's what we do, basically. <laughs> so self-doubt, oh my God, it's so fascinating because it's such a big to- I can understand why it's completely held your attention for four years because it it's everything, isn't it? It just affects everything. I feel like I don't know a single person who isn't, you know, struggling with things that it doesn't come down to self-doubt and it feels that it's a particularly female struggle. Yeah. You know, that's that. I think that's such an interesting point because actually it's not, it's very human, but I think, and this is a gross generalization, but I, I, I suspect that women are just much more, we find it safer to talk about these things. Yeah. More, perhaps more so than, than men. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and we can talk about a crisis in masculinity mm. another time. But I do think that we are better, perhaps, in general, at connecting with each other and finding these kind of vulnerable places that we we all relate to. Mm. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. It, it isn't. It isn't any more or greater. The research certainly doesn't suggest that this is a more or greater experience for women that it's not a gendered experience at all that's interesting and actually that does make sense doesn't it because I suppose as women we are brought up to be more not brought up to when I say brought up I mean in the world in the universe to probably say our feelings a lot more than men yeah are, absolutely yeah. yeah yeah well and and I, and I think you know our what is interesting, though, is that our response to self-doubt tends to be kind of along gendered lines. So when men feel self-doubt, and that is translated as fear, mm. it's often responded to through assertion or anger or a deflection into something like drinking or sport or you know, there's kind of like a doing aspect to right. to the response. Um, whereas when women feel self doubt, it kind of can often get translated as um, a sort of incompetence rather than a fear, right? It's almost like a oh, I'm I'm just really crap at this. Yeah. And so then that the response from from women tends to be more kind of using a stick to beat ourselves with yeah 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 so it's that like an internal versus an external response yeah exactly mm. yeah it's a great way of looking at it. <coughs> yeah yeah oh that's really interesting so what so I've obviously done your workshop or retreat yes. what would it was it what would you call it the write yourself home it's like a retreat isn't it yeah it's kind of it's interesting because I wanted to do a I wanted to create an experience that you could do in a day Mm -hmm. and that would allow you to delve quite deeply into a couple of areas where self-doubt is most acute Mm -hmm. and kind of come away with with feeling differently about that. Yeah. That's kind of like a day, right? And we always do it on a Saturday because that's just a hell of a lot easier to organize for most people. And um, yeah, and it is. It's kind of like a day retreat. So you get fed, you get loved up. Um, it's a, we always, I always try and find really nice venues that just feel really lush. Mm. Um, and the women that come are obviously, um, amazing. Oh, it was just the most profound, amazing experience. And, and people that I knew that had done, done it beforehand had said to me, Oh my God, you're going to have the best time, but they couldn't really explain how. And that didn't make sense to me before because I'm a real, um, questioner, um, and I wanted some facts in front of me. I'm a very typical Virgo, so I need some hard evidence of what's going, what exactly is going to happen, and what am I going to see at the end of it. <laughs> Love it. I'm married to a Virgo. I totally appreciate that requirement. Yeah. And I just kept getting these kind of. No, but you you will feel so safe and wonderful and you'll just love it. You'll love it. And I was like, I don't understand. Yeah. But, I mean, now if I was going to explain to somebody else, that's exactly how I would explain it. <laughs> Yeah, I, f- I find it quite tricky to explain as well. So mm. you're not alone. But I do think there's something quite, and I hesitate to w- use the word magical, mm. but there is something a little bit special, right? When we come together in person, um, 
And often I find people will come to those workshops that are sort of connected online yeah. and then like through Instagram particularly or Twitter and then suddenly you're within smelling distance of these people that you've had these little conversations mm. with, sometimes for years. Mm. Um, and it, I think it can just deepen a, the, those connections because um, yeah. you already kind of know, oh, these are my people, it's safe here. Yeah. It yeah. felt very safe. It was wonderful, really, really amazing. And it really brought up a lot of things for me. Yeah. And one of the things I wanted to talk about today is not necessarily something that came up on the day, but I think just because I feel very much more aware of patterns and certain feelings I'm having since since that day, I've noticed I've I'm very addicted to feedback and I have been finding that to be, I don't, I, I don't want to use the word trigger because actually it's not necessarily a trigger. It's more of a resistance patch. Mm -hmm. So in moving forward, so I want, I'm moving to Brighton and um, I won't have childcare and I was thinking about how my work life is going to look over the next few months Um how, what I'm going to do with the podcast because it's coming up to kind of hiatus around May um, and am I actually going to take a break because I said initially that I was going to and I didn't I kept going and why that is so all of that is to say that I looked at all of these things and was like what do I want to do like, what I want to do is just stop working and just hang out with an IS um, enjoy Brighton go to mum and baby groups get to know people have a slow summer um and slow in in the sense that not working i won't be it'll be very fast paced i'm sure but my i don't know my inner it's not even my inner person it's my it, it, the resistance is that i'm like but what, but i love the feedback i i every week a podcast episode is released or a blog post is released or i post an instagram and I get all this amazing validation, I, I feel like I'm high off it. And mm. if I don't get it, I really feel, I, I immediately think, well, what I've done is rubbish because I'm not getting loads of people telling me I'm amazing. That is just so fascinating. <laughs> Isn't it? Do you, I, I think you it is, yeah. like, Oh, this is interesting that yeah. I'm having this experience. Yeah, I, I do find it interesting. And it felt like, I mean, I, I don't, I genuinely don't think I would have come to that realisation if I hadn't done, um, if I hadn't met you and been a part of Write Yourself Home because I could see, I could see the patterns. Mm -hmm. I could see where they were coming. I felt like I could see it really clearly. But now, but, yeah, so now I was like, well, what do I do about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really curious because I, I think you're you're describing an experience that I imagine everyone listening into is nodding along to. Yeah. Um, and so and so there's a couple of things that are coming up for me. Um, one is that you mentioned the word validation. You started by saying feedback, and then you went, "It's actually about validation." Yes. Yes. And I wonder right. if there is a distinction for you between the two. I think. Hmm. I, I feel like they're quite closely intertwined and I don't want to sound really up my own ass when I say this, but with the podcast, I, it is a very lovely space and mm -hmm. it's so different to blogging in the, or to even Twitter. I don't get trolls. I mean, I've had one negative kind of bit of feedback, but I, I don't really get trolls. I don't get people, I don't know. Yeah, so it's a very safe space. It's very, it feels very safe. It's, you know, really lovely place where people feel that they intimate, I guess it is, because mm -hmm. you're speaking to people. Um, mm -hmm. And because of that, I think, I don't know. Yeah, and I suppose it, I, it is feedback, but you're right, it is validation. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that the majority of the feedback is positive. Yeah. So it's it's validating. Yeah, it is validation. Yeah, it is 100% well, and, validation. And, yeah. you know, Lois, I'm just thinking that who doesn't want more safe, loving, intimate, positive <laughs> feedback? Yeah, that's true. 
Right, like that's the kind dream. of one of our like basic human needs. Yeah. Right, we we all are, and I think it comes down to something kind of underneath that for me, which is, you know, do you see me? Do I matter? Mm. Is what I'm doing helpful, useful? You know, what's my purpose? Like there's some bigger things that are coming up, right, underneath all of that. Mm. I think, and, um, yeah, am I providing value? Am I good enough? Yeah. Well, you're go- so you're going into some some uh, uh, another branch off this tree, right? Because <laughs> that is more about. Um, it, it, and I wonder if you can just sense the difference there. That safe, loving, intimate, positive feedback is about filling you up, mm. and then going into you know, and, and it's like I'm seen, I'm valued, I feel good. And then there is the kind of other side of things, the other sort of feedback that we can get or even the feedback we can give ourselves, which is about, you know, is this good enough? Am I good enough? Mm. Do I matter? Does my work matter? Is this valuable? Am I valuable? Mm. Um, And so and I think for most of us who are working, you know, in quite values led, heartfelt businesses, uh, ventures, we can often conflate the two. Mm. but you know, So we kind of, there's a Venn diagram with a very slim kind of um, overlay, which is me and my work. And so if, if my work is valued, then I feel valued. Mm. Because our work is so much a part of us. Um, so so the, the thing that's coming up for me around that validation is that um, I think it's such a lovely, human, wonderful thing to want more of. Yeah, but then don't because the thing that kind of struck me was that if I if I believe all of the positive feedback, then doesn't that mean that I also have to believe all the negative feedback? Because can I unpick the two? Can I kind of cherry pick? Oh, all the positive stuff that makes me feel great. That's correct. But when one person says something like your audio is rubbish or um, you're not providing value or whatever, um. Or I don't like your hair. Or I don't like your hair. Yeah, exactly. Or yeah. You, you're annoying. Yeah. yeah. Do I, am I allowed to then be like, well, I don't believe those things? Well, um, so what you're describing is, is actually a really natural um, place to be, uh, just in terms of our own development as adults. Right. So um, there, and there is a, entire body of research around this which I find really fascinating and and informs a lot of my work around self-doubt and that is that we like we know about children's development right that at certain ages we go through certain stages of how we see the world and how we understand our place in it um and for a long time we sort of thought and then you turn 21 and you're an adult (laughs) and at some point in your 40s you're probably going to do something stupid and we'll call that a midlife (laughs) crisis and then you'll retire you know and at some point you'll die and that's kind of adulthood yeah (laughs) um but actually in the last sort of 20 to 30 years there's been much more investigation into the experience of adulthood Mm. and what that is like and that it isn't just a linear process of aging and getting more responsible Um, it's actually very different and we go through different sort of ways of being in the world and there is this kind of way of being in the world where we kind of get quite fused with the things we care about so it can be um, an organization or or a workplace or a kind of work um, but it could be, you know, a, a, a community we're in, like a, an activist group or even a political movement or um, or even just a group of friends, right? We sort of surround ourselves, uh, we find our identities within the communities that we're in. And you you can kind of see this, like if you've ever worked in a workplace where someone is a real like evangelist for the organisation, mm-hmm. And they kind of feel like the company is amazing and I'm so glad I work here and I work for this brand and it's incredible. Um, And there's this sort of, um, yeah, it is an evangelizing. And we can often do that with our friends and we can do that with um, with the communities that we create and we find ourselves in. And, And it kind of becomes the core of who we are. It's sort of like if I'm not a success in this thing, 
Um, and it might be something like a parent or a partner or a lawyer or a salesperson or an Instagram influencer. Um, but it's sort of like if I don't meet some external objective characteristic of success that this group or this role values, then who am I really and what am I on about? Mm-hmm. And when we get quite f- quite sort of um, attached or fused with our roles, um, it can get really hard when you're starting to expand your your world, right? So, and when changes happen, so you're in this kind of precipice of change where you're moving house, you're moving, um, your, your support system is going to change. Um, you're kind of starting to question things, which is a really natural place to get to. And when we're in this place of being quite attached to the external validation of whatever group we're in, we kind of decide that we can feel good about ourselves if other people are feeling good about us. Mm. And it, and it's a really like kind of addictive place to be when Crazy. you're getting all that positive feedback, yeah. right? And and I so relate to this because for a long time in my career, I got lots and lots of positive feedback um, from from you know senior management and all that kind of stuff. It was like, yeah, you're doing really well, and this is amazing. So I was like. Oh, this is it. I'm totally nailing it here. Yeah. I feel amazing about myself. And then I had a huge failure. A project that I managed failed badly and I did not handle it very well. And I kind of retreated into this very sort of defensive and protective place because I was so frightened about what it meant. If I let that, you know, if I was not this thing, then who was I? Mm. And I, and I had the first inklings of understanding that maybe I was Maybe I had a, attached to this organization too far and I kind of lost myself in it. And yeah. that feeling of being a little bit lost in where we are is often, it's often kind of tied to this, this hunger for validation, for, um, you know, just tell me that I'm doing this right. Tell yeah. me I'm allowed to do this. Tell me it's okay what I'm doing. And of course, in our world now where we are, self-employed and we're doing this all on our own we don't have those sources of external validation apart from often social media Mm. and of course social media is not uh, an an altruistic thing Mm -hmm. right (laughs) it's actually and and I love that you use the word that you're starting to feel a little bit addicted to it because Mm. I think one of the things we always have to remember is that social media is very intentionally set up to uh, to stimulate our dopamine receptors, right? It actually feels really bloody good to see those likes and those hearts yeah. and those comments and all of that stuff. It, it's it's very um, it's a very kind of subtle but powerful psychological uh, tool that is being used to keep us. Um, attached to whatever the app is that we're using. Mm-hmm. So they don't really care what that does to us. <laughs> but it can have this huge impact on us. And so when you've got these two things fusing, right, your own kind of place where you are in terms of your own development as a human, and this, um, and that is overlaid with this techno- technology that is both magical and also doesn't really give a toss about the impact it has. It's more interested in keeping you attached to it. Then, you know, it's like, um, you know, it's a perfect storm mm. for this feeling that I need this validation from from other people. That's how I know I'm doing it right. But how do we break that addiction? Because... So my my kind of gut reaction was okay. Like I'd, I'm I'm pretty good with social media. I don't have any of the apps on my phone, but given that it's my job to be and you know to have a certain amount of online presence, uh, my reaction was well, you know what? When the podcast naturally comes to an end, I'm going to stop it for a few months, um, <clears throat> and then until I'm kind of ready to start again and I have a rough date in mind that I want that to be um I'll I'll probably still blog but um I won't be doing anything in my real job which is kind of journalism and then I won't need to be online that was kind of my gut reaction well I'll just stop working then 
Yeah. And that's how I'll break my addiction. But it feels like it's quite extreme. I mean, there are, to be fair, there are other reasons why I want to stop working. And it is the right decision. And it is only temporary. But, yeah, I'm, I don't know. Like, how do you... If I wasn't to stop working, and I am going to come back to work at some point, how do I break that addiction, that cycle of addiction that I've... Well, I, I think, first of all, just recognising that it, it, it has, is having a disproportionate level of influence on you is really important. Because mm-hmm. I think sometimes we think, oh, we're just doing it wrong, because everyone else seems to be handling this whole social media thing really well, <laughs> or we're all crap, so it doesn't really matter. You know? <laughs> um, but I think just recognising, actually, this does not feel good to me. Like, yeah. there's something in me that's saying, oh, I don't feel great about myself or the world or my work yeah. when I'm constantly on you know, consuming information or kind of waiting for um, waiting for validation mm. and then making it mean a whole lot of stuff about me. Yeah. Um, and so just recognising that is is the first step. <laughs> um, but I think, I think it's really interesting that you're sort of talking about, well, I'm just going to switch off. Like it's a kind of, you know, the automatic response is it's not okay to be in it, so I'm going to get out of it. Yeah. Is, is a totally natural response. Um, and I think sometimes just moving away or gaining some distance from that thing that we've sort of been breathing in and, and it's been inhabiting us um, can really help. But I also think that it, it's the, the real key to this is about start because the next stage of development is when you start to recognize that every single external authority is flawed. Mm-hmm. Right, so you recognize that every organization is run by flawed humans. Right? Every <laughs> system is created by flawed humans. Even you Apple. Know, no one has the answer, right? Yeah. Um, and just recognizing that it's like, oh, I'm putting my hopes and aspirations and dreams on something that is actually made of sand. Yeah. And so we, when that happens, it can throw us a bit, right? Because mm. we find that we're, um, when we're constantly trying to make ourselves right and fit in, and then we find the thing we're trying to fit in with is actually a bit flawed, you can feel a bit at sea. Mm. You can feel a bit like, oh, who the hell am I now then? And what can happen is that you start to, what, what what is best to happen, what we hope will happen, is that you actually start to trust yourself. You start to use your discernment around what, what, uh, feedback negative or positive you actually want to take notice of and you know I wonder I I don't know I've just been thinking about a client that I worked with that it might be helpful just to kind of characterize this a little bit because she used a really great metaphor that I think might be helpful um so I had this client who was an academic brilliant woman she had a PhD in something really scientific. She was working at Cambridge um, and she had kind of risen to a sort of dean level kind of um, in her department. And she was finding out that different people had very different views about her. Like some of them were really warm and quite, you know, admiring and others were not so much. Um, And this is really typical, like for anyone who kind of gets into a leadership position, um, there was this, there is always this kind of imbalance. The more mm-hmm. visible we get, the more opinions of other people, the more, the more opinions of other people we're going to be exposed to. So the, the negative kind of feelings about her were causing her an enormous amount of grief because she was sort of breathing those in and she couldn't really feel good about herself when other people were feeling bad about her. And she said to me once, Sass, it's like there is a mirror on the chest of everyone I'm talking to and I see myself in that mirror. And sometimes the mirror on their chest reflects an image that I really like of myself and other times it's one that I really don't want to look at. Mm. And when I see that image, the one that I don't want to look at, I just want to go and like change their mirror. I want to polish it or shift it or kind of throw it away. And so I really focus on that person and try to get that person's mirror of me to change. Um, and and as as I'm doing that, if I'm successful, then I can turn around and then some other mirror has changed, right? So it, I'm kind of doing this dance to constantly 
make people kind of like me. And there are too many people in my life, too many mirrors, and I kind of want to pull all of that into myself so that when I look at them, I can just see them. And when I look at me, I can just see me. Oh, I and then I that. would be less troubled, right? But I don't know how to do that. I love that, that metaphor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I love yeah, that metaphor. It's so, I don't know, so clear. I know. I was like, dude, this Light is Light bulb. I'm going to use this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think this is the thing is that actually this is, about our humanity, right? We're socialized. We, we are very social beings. It matters to us that we um, are part of groups, right? That's how we survive in our families and our, in our workplaces and our community groups. Um, and for a very long time, um, you know, probably the best thing that ever happened to humanity was that we all um, sub, sort of subordinate to what's most important to the group. Yeah. Um, so we could expand, um, you know, our, our species. Um, and as long as those kind of circles of people lived inside a community and paid attention to the same leaders or the same rules, then this was, this was how we survived and grew. But now we live in a much more complex world, right, where there are all these different authorities, different communities, different people we need to satisfy. And it can be exhausting yeah. to feel like, as the same way as my client was, that we've got to kind of try and control everybody's mirrors. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, and eventually, instead of sort of being deciding that she was how she was reflected, um, she started to kind of, and we use the metaphor of rather than being written as she was reflected, she picked up her own pen and began to write herself. Uh-huh. And so this is what I think you're talking about is how do we get out of this place of being kind of addicted to feedback, addicted to external validation. Um, and, and I think part of this is that we, when we can start to sort of see that other people's opinions and views of us are always filtered through their own crap yeah. <laughs> and good stuff, right? Yeah. That everyone is flawed. Um, then we get to sort of cherry pick and edit and write and revise and pull into ourselves the the kind of invisible thing that we want to guide us, the, the sort of values and the principles that we want to live by. Um, that is a good tip. That's such a light bulb. Such a light bulb. Yeah. It's the, the, because I think we're told, we are sort of told that um, criticism, you, you should be good at taking constructive criticism Mm -hmm. Uh, we're not really told you can cherry pick and actually your own your own understanding of yourself and Mm -hmm. building a strong sense of self is so much more important than having other people tell it to you yeah well and I and I kind of see this as a it's really a kind of employment problem mm. right we basically we we're sort of you know if we are our own organizations we're employing external people to tell us how to live our lives <laughs> right and actually they are the least qualified people often yeah. because sometimes they have really it's the negative folks that we most of us will spend an, um, a, a disproportionate amount of our energy trying right. to please or to kind of win round or just worry about. Yeah. Um, and that's because we, our brains have a negative bias where mm. some of the research suggests we are sort of eight times more, um, more sensitive to negative experiences and feedback than we are to positive. God, isn't that And that's just incredible. designed to keep us safe, mm. right? Um. So if we're if we're kind of pulling all of our energy into the into those people, putting all our energy into those people, you know, looking at ourselves as we're reflected in their mirrors as negative, mm. we don't like your hair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if all those people are kind of running our show, it's no wonder we feel kind of discombobulated and yeah. like, who the hell am I? Yeah. Um, and I think it's that thing of, and and Tara Moore talks about this in her book. Um, about unhooking from criticism and praise. And I think that's kind of, that feels to me like the next step for you, mm. 
right, is that the praise is fabulous, um, but the but the um, the criticism is is hard to take. Yeah, and also the indifference, right? The silence, right? Is the oh. Most lost, right? Oh, it's terrible. So there's kind of a third piece to this <laughs> that I think Tara probably missed, but because sometimes for you know the indifference, right? No likes on a yeah. picture is worse than it's anything. Totally. <laughs> so so for me, it's like you know that of those, if those three kind of outcomes for you. Uh, and anyone listening, if the, if your identity, your sense of self, your the value you place on yourself, if you're having a good day because you get lots of positive feedback and you have a crappy day if you get negative or no feedback, then it's a really a great sort of exercise to go through is to just really pay attention to, and I would always, always say go into your body around this because our minds are the ones that are creating all the stories. Right, but our bodies will give us information too around just the sensations you feel when you are experiencing negative feedback or no feedback. Mm-hmm. So, and like can, if you tense up, or yeah, 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 you might tense up. You might kind of. I always kind of get that lead and belly feeling. Mm. You know, like I've got rocks in my belly, yeah. or um, or I'll feel a sort of tightness in my throat. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes I actually feel like I can't sort of move my arms up very far. It's quite weird. Mm, um, interesting. But I found that it's almost like we kind of contract. Yeah. And um, and that's a really interesting thing to pay attention to. Can you just be with that? Can you be with that sensation? What we know is that our bodies are insanely smart. Mm-hmm. And are always working to bring us back to the state of homeostasis, which is when we are regulated. All right, so our heartbeat is normal, our you know our um, sensations are, are kind of relaxed, um, our cortisol and um, adrenaline levels are low. So so our bodies are always working to bring us back to our natural state, which is a peaceful state. Mm-hmm. And so any of those icky experiences we have, those feelings, those sensations, will only last about 90 seconds. Except if you're having a go. I'm going to caveat this <laughs> because it reminded me as you were talking, I was like, this is the perfect state for a really beautiful, peaceful, not peaceful, a really beautiful, easy childbirth. <clears throat> um and then I, 90 seconds, I was like, yeah, that is how it should last, how long the icky feeling should last. And then I was thinking of some of my contractions. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're talking about a different experience. I don't yeah. have children, but I understand it is very different. <laughs> but I love that you went to that extreme place. Right? I know. It's actually, so this is the same as childbirth. Yeah. <laughs> right. And actually, I, I would caveat that and say, it's probably not. Yeah, it's not really. <laughs> but it's an amazing piece of evidence that you have, that you have already birthed a child and you have been through body sensations that, you know, it are incredibly, extremely painful. And you have survived that. <laughs> yeah. A really great thing came from that. It's yeah. a beautiful metaphor to bring to this work mm. around, actually, you have a shit ton of resilience. Mm. Your body is a magnificent thing that has kept you um, going and created this amazing being that you now have. And the reason I kind of thought of it is because I was thinking, um, because I didn't do hypnobirthing or anything like that, but I had a home birth, which then ended up in hospital. But um, I read a lot about childbirth and kind of the best state to be in and all those sort of things. And what you were describing was the very basic kind of state that yeah. our bodies are always trying to get us to that lovely calm yeah peaceful whatever um and and the cortisol and the adrenaline being just the right levels and not spiking all over the place and that is exactly what I kept reading was yeah. the most important thing in childbirth you know adrenaline fear is just it will and, and you can see it well you as soon as I st- started shaking in childbirth I was like okay I've got too much adrenaline I need to get rid of this because this is slowing down my labor and it's the first time that I've seen 
that kind of seen my body working outside of myself, if that makes sense. Like, I, it's the first time mm-hmm. I've actually seen my bodily functions, for want yes. of a better word. <laughs> yes, that makes so much sense. <laughs> well, and I love, I love this as a metaphor because actually as soon as we fight those feelings, right, as soon as we get into that place of I shouldn't be feeling this, mm. right, the, the, you know, you've had a, a neg- some negative feedback or something awful has happened and it's creating a physical sensation that you're then resisting, that's going to be the slowest way to the other side. Right. Right. It, it was utterly kind of mind-bendingly transform- transformative for me to to understand like really get that our natural state is a peaceful one mm. I was like I remember my therapist telling this to me and I thought what are you on lady <laughs> my natural state is not that <laughs> um and and actually you know and and I sort of have now uh, years later developed a meditation practice and I try and get into that place you know, a couple of times a day. Yeah. And it, it, it just giving yourself that experience of a peaceful body and a peaceful mind, even for a few minutes a day. And my mind still goes a bit nuts through, through meditation. I have a really kind of spinny, um, thought process, but I still have that experience of a calm, relaxed, peaceful body that I can tap into, you know, just, just kind of go up and down, re- watching my thoughts as much as I can. Um, I think that's super important. But, and, but I think yeah. this, and this is the thing is that once we kind of recognize that, oh, okay, I'm just, I'm just having an experience of, it might be embarrassment or shame, mm. right? It might be, um, a sense of, oh, I've done this wrong or someone doesn't like me or, um, oh, they're judging me, right? Our, kind of our worst fears because they're, those fears are all tied with, I, I will be kicked out of the tribe. Yeah. Right, so it's that feeling that I am risking my very belonging is what this is tied to, which is why it's such a primal response for so yeah. many of us. Um, but if you can sit with that and let your body take you back to, back to peace and then kind of use your intellect to kind of go, okay, let me just take this out of my brain and put it on a piece of paper. What did they actually say? And what What do I want to take from that? What is true for me about that? Uh, Recognizing that every human is flawed and every opinion that everyone has is filtered through their own experience and their own mood and sometimes their um, menstrual cycle, sometimes they have had a fight with their wife. You know, wherever someone is at, we have no real understanding of Mm. And, and we can, we can't then employ that person to decide how we're going to feel about ourselves. Yes. Yeah. That's so true. Because, yeah. Because if you were running, if you were working for Google or wherever, you know, you wouldn't employ someone who had no qualifications to do a job that was super important. You just wouldn't. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh such, that is such a good tool to have yeah. in my, to in everyone who's listening as well, their toolkit. And so one thing I did want to, it kind of leads us on quite nicely to comparison, mm-hmm. which as we all know is the thief of joy. Um, in, so I have a really amazing, lovely Facebook group for the podcast. And every other week we kind of get super honest and I start it off and I'll say three things that I'm feeling a bit icky about that week or just three honest things so it might not be that I'm feeling icky it might be that I feel great about this one part of my life and I feel weird about sharing it or whatever yeah and then everybody else does the same and it's a really really nice space because everybody cheers each other on and um and oh, and I do and I reply to every single person and read every single comment in the thread and I see a pattern like a few little patterns each week and typically it's things like I don't feel like I'm good enough to start xyz I'm not hitting goals that I set for myself that have come but I'm seeing other people doing it or I'm uh, I wanted to do this um, but I can't seem to do it, but I can see somebody else online. They're just amazing. And I see that quite a lot. 
Mm-hmm. Why can't I do what blah, blah, blah seems to be doing so effortlessly? And I, I mean, compa- we all know comparison is just the easiest way to make you feel just rubbish. Mm-hmm. But the thing that I didn't ever consider before was that was other people comparing themselves to us. Mm-hmm. And how actually that can make you feel rubbish as well. So if you know that somebody else compares themselves to you and you're their trigger, for want of a better word, that also makes you feel super rubbish. But, mm-hmm. And I've been, I've been feeling that a lot over the past few, yeah, few weeks, I guess. And, and I'm really trying not, to, and I found myself, my initial reaction was to change my behavior because I don't want to make, I I want to make myself smaller to make that other person feel less threatened by me or I want to show rubbish parts of my life more so that I, so that other people never feel like they compare themselves to me but actually I I now feel like what I don't need to do any of those things because it's actually not my business what other people it, it's not my fault it's mm-hmm. what I'm. What I suppose I'm trying to get to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just want to acknowledge your amazing natural ability to build a community. <laughs> Thank you. Right, like that's not a that's not a thing that lots of people find easy. And it sounds like you're doing this from a really beautiful, compassionate place. So I just want to. I just want to big you up. Oh, <laughs> We're talking that. about feeling that feeling of smallness because <laughs> I think that is a that is a wonderful thing to um, to be doing, right? And to be sharing both the great and the not so great parts. Yeah, is is a is a really brave <laughs> and courageous thing to do. Oh, thanks. So I just wanted to kind of say what you're doing is really important. And I think it's a natural byproduct of creating a community where we kind of like to try and find our place within it, Mm. right? So it's that same kind of thing of, you know, when our identity is attached to external groups, we, um, we like to sort of rank ourselves and, and, you know, we kind of get a sense of who's like us, who's a bit ahead of us, who's behind us. Mm. And then we sort of find our place in there. So there's a sort of natural means of oh do I belong here are you my people but when it gets to a state of comparison it can be I I completely agree with you I think it's one of the most painful and insidious experiences that we can have Mm. and the thing about comparison is that I think it is a sort of shit way of trying to create safety Mm. (laughs) So so it's like if I kind of find out where I fit I can feel safe here yeah but in the process of finding out where I fit, I'm realizing all of the bits that I'm missing that you seem to have that I really want. Yeah. And and so I sort of see um, I sort of see that feeling of comparison and and the sort of despairing feeling that it can lead to. Um, it is very much it's like our internal longings, the things we're longing for for ourselves, and we see other people having we sort of tell ourselves a story that, well, she's got that, so you can't have it. Yes, that's so true. There's only one thing that everyone can have, yeah. Yeah, and it's and it's almost like we see the world then as a sort of massive pie and it's all divided up between people, mm. right? So there's a popularity pie, and if that person's got 250,000 followers, then she's taken those followers and I can't have them. Yes, that's so and true. actually, it, the pot. Everyone gets a whole pie. <laughs> <laughs> there's never just. There's never ever been one pie. But that is actually how our culture is set up, right? Our whole culture is based on you know there is a limited amount of money, there is a limited amount of oxygen. There, you know, and actually those things are not true. Yeah, right. Yeah, because yeah, as soon true. as we had the financial crisis, we just printed more money. Yes, that's actually how we got out of it. <laughs> right. And um, having worked in that industry, in the financial services industry, I can assure you that there is an unlimited amount of money in the world. It is very disproportionately and unfairly distributed. Yeah. But it is unlimited. 
right? So this idea that we all have a whole pie can sometimes shift the perspective a little bit. And, and where I, I think comparison is really closely related to inspiration, mm. but it's like our, we tell ourselves a story that um, rather than being inspired by that person and sort of going, what are they actually doing? And what about what they're doing feels good to me? And is there a way I can translate that into my own stuff? Or, you know, how can I, how can I bring that in and make it mine? And there'll be things that we, you know, again, we cherry pick, we edit, we bring in the things that feel good to us. And, and I think it's also worth recognizing that well, two things really. One, that we can never ever see everything that's going on in a person's life. Um, and trust me, I coach with um, some really well-known people, not just in the social media world, but out there in the general world. Yeah. <laughs> what is that world? Out, who, who would be like, you know, who everyone compares themselves to, yeah. which is actually, you're right, a burden to carry. Yeah. Because then it's like, I cannot show vulnerability because I'll be ripped apart yeah, or absolutely. you won't admire me anymore and I'm a little bit, I, I like that. That's mm. kind of my currency. Mm. Um, so we can't ever kind of know what's going on behind the scenes with someone and that's that phrase, right? We're comparing our our insides to someone else's outsides, mm. which is more possible than ever because of social media. Totally. Um, so we look at someone's, you know, beautiful kitchen with their whole like you know this smacked out a back wall and you know this critter windows <laughs> and the, the marble island and the brass taps and all that jazz or oh, it's maybe that's just me right now <laughs> um and we think oh buggy you you've got the you've got the kitchen you know and actually it's like well i can just create some of that yeah. if I want, you know so we kind of we kind of miss out on you know what what is what of the thing that we're actually comparing ourselves to what can we have and what what are we saying that someone else has got it so now it's no longer available to us Mm. right so there's that there's that part of it right that we can never really know what's going on behind the scenes you know and then you that's the thing right you open the drawers and it's chaos right so we assume everyone else is doing this whole adult thing right (laughs) but actually we're all just making this up as we go along yes yeah you know say true and, and, you know, and the other part of it is that we cannot make ourselves big enough for someone else to feel better about themselves. Mm. Equally, we cannot make ourselves small enough mm. for someone else to feel better about themselves. Because we're, we've all, we're all, our work in the world, I believe, is to kind of figure out who we are and, and learn in whatever way that comes to us how we can accept and love and trust ourselves. And I think that's our real jobs. And then we just, you know, meanwhile, we're sort of doing that in different contexts, right? So it might be that we're in a lawyer's office or we're running an online business, Mm. you know, or or we're a teacher or whatever. But our real work in the world, to me, is to learn that, is to learn how to to accept and love and trust ourselves. And that is... And that's a big job, yeah. right? And so I, what I do find with the whole, the kind of inverse of comparison is that we often try to make ourselves small so other people won't feel bad about themselves. Mm-hmm. And that gives, that, that kind of does both of us a disservice because it, it reduces our own satisfaction and fulfillment and pride in what we're achieving. And it also kind of patronizes the other person. That I'm, I, you know, I I don't believe you can do this either. So I'm just going to make you feel. I'm going to try and be really, really careful around you. Yes, oh, I never right. thought about it like that. Yeah, and actually, I think the, the the healthier way through, and certainly I'm just, you know, and I'm learning this as I'm going too, because you know I'm a natural caretaker, right? So mm-hmm. I want to kind of scoop people up and go, it's going to be fine. <laughs> but if they don't believe that, this I can say that a million different ways, and no one's going to believe that. This is why I never post inspirational quotes because I think they can just reinforce all the things that you don't believe about yourself. Yes. Anyway. Yeah. Um, oh, I've never noticed that, but yeah, that's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I think I'm the only coach that doesn't do that. Anyway. <laughs> um, but I do think that, you know, by actually, by actually saying, well, this is what I see you doing right now. That's amazing. Right. And recognizing that. that we are all where we are. I know that sounds so 
kind of trite. But, but, you know, this whole idea that, you know, we've got to be achieving and, and goals and expanding and it's all about growth and progress and all of these things. Actually, I think there's a ton of myths around, around goals, um, that it, research that I'm kind of really deeply in, into suggests that um, a lot of goals and solution solution kind of coaching around goals is based on this model where you say, here's where you are now, here's where you want to be, and then you sort of beat yourself into submission during the gap to try and make sure that you stay on track so you reach the goal. And I found that actually, you know, in that place of comparison, she's further ahead than me. Um, he's, he's doing the thing that I want to be doing. Um, they seem to have all of this sorted out and I don't. So I'm going to make my goal their goal. And then I'm going to try and kind of get myself to that place because some authority is telling me that this is where I need to be. And what I found is that actually when you can enjoy the process, like love the hard work, that's going to get you there. And this is my ongoing lesson, right? I'm, so I'm not in any way suggesting this is easier or a better way, but this is just what I have found personally, is that I have to love the process. Mm. Right? I have to kind of, I have to enjoy myself where I am right now and also be excited about where I'm going. It has to be something that is fulfilling me and I'm a, and I'm kind of looking forward to doing. And even when I'm not looking forward to doing, I get that it is a necessary part of the big picture. And that big picture is so glorious to me that I am willing to do my tax return. <laughs> right? Which is tedious as shit, you know. Yeah, I'm willing to work out how to use this technology, even though I just want to scream because I see what it can offer me. Yeah. You know? And I think this is the thing is – all of this is what this whole kind of way of being is doing is we're pulling our energy back into ourselves, right? We're looking at what's my path, where am I right now, and where am I going, and can I get excited about that? Rather than looking outside, seeing what inspiration you get, and then going, oh, okay, I really like what that person's doing. Mm. What about that? Not, I don't want to be that person because that job's taken. But what about what that person's doing? What is she doing that I'm excited about? And how would that feel to me? If I was going to do that kind of thing, what might that look like to me? How can I translate that into my mirror inside of me? Oh, it comes back to like, listening to yourself and following your intuition again doesn't it dude yeah. you've got it <laughs> i've cracked it that's it, I've cracked it. Yeah. so I, so i'm i'm wondering about like how just to bring this back to you <laughs> so i'm wondering about like just as we've been talking about this stuff like how you're feeling now about this idea of um of kind of moving house and then having some time off like is that still feeling like something that feels really important to you yeah but it feels less about um having to you know check out of everything online <clears throat> and more about just okay I'm I'm not going to be doing my journalism over the next few months that's cool I'm not going to be pitching and all of that sort of stuff but and the podcast will be on hiatus I'm okay with that but I'll still check into social media or I'll still post on Instagram and I'll still blog when I want to. It feels, it feels less absolute. Yeah. Which is where and I wanted to get to, I think. That, well, that, and that is the, the kind of that, that play, that next stage of adult development is about self authoring. That's what it's kind of called. And that is exactly what it, it's one of the characteristics of self authoring is that we come back to a place of balance where we take what we, what, it feels good to us do what feels good to us which is the per perfect phrase to end it on i think yeah I'm sorry i've made this into a massive therapy session for me actually I, I'm not it. <laughs> <laughs> i talk a lot more when i'm doing a podcast interview than when i'm doing a session so oh, I, really? I quite okay. liked that maybe good. i'll do that more <laughs> you should yes so speaking yeah. of your podcast um please plug it and also let everyone know where they can find you online. And also, I want to hear about your book. 
<laughs> please so okay cool so um you'll find me at sasspetherick.com and the podcast is called courage and spice and it's the podcast for humans with self-doubt um and actually one thing i'd love to mention is that i'm doing this thing at the moment uh it's called the my courageous selfie project yes, and okay. it's a hashtag and if you go to the podcast you'll find there's a website for it courage and spice.com and there is a shop in there where you can buy some really cool t-shirts and 100% of the profits are going to be shared between two organizations who work with young people to help them cultivate self-belief. So it's a, it's just a pure like um, social enterprise venture kind of thing that I'm doing. Um, but yeah, so we, we launched it like last week and have sold like 50 t-shirts Yay. and made a couple hundred quid already. So oh, I'm, I'm so absolutely pleased. stoked. Yeah. I'm so, so pleased. It's such an important Thing. And also, just as an aside, the t-shirts are super soft. They're amazing. Yeah, um, it was really important to me that they were kind of kind to our bodies and kind to the planet. So they're really all like nice. knitted yogurt kind of deal. Um, yeah. And they wash well, I'm just saying. They do. <laughs> yeah, they That's do. important. Yeah. <laughs> and um, oh, the other thing I can plug if people are interested, the, the workshop that we talked about at the yes. start of the episode, Write Yourself Home, I'm doing a, um, I'm going to be doing one in Manchester in oh. September. Oh, We're just sort of finalising all the details. Um, so if people go to my website, they can sign up and they'll get first notice when tickets go on sale. Amazing. Thank you so much, Beth. That was so much fun. Total pleasure. Loved it. Thanks for listening to what she said. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, please think about leaving me a five-star rating and a review if you have time. This really helps other people find the podcast and means that Apple don't hide me in their box. If you fancy joining my small but perfectly formed bunch of podcast fans for chit chat on Facebook, head to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash what she said podcast and come and join us.